So you're thinking about becoming a skydiver or you simply want to make your first tandem skydive but you're not sure how safe it truly is. So my name is Salvador Chang and I'm going to be going over all things safety today relative to skydiving. So in this video we will not only go over the statistics about skydiving and how safe it is but we will also go over the practical ways of how skydiving we can make it safer as individuals and we will go over the equipment being used this way we understand what to do in case of emergencies. So just to give you guys a little bit of background about me, I am a senior rigger, I am a packer, and I do work at here at Skydive Deland. I'm also a fun jumper. Yo! All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the video. Okay guys, so getting into the statistics, I have a really hard time saying that word. The statistics of skydiving and actually how safe it is with numbers. So I'm gonna go ahead and read them off my phone because they are a lot and I do not wanna mess them up moving forward. So first things first, tandem skydiving has the safest statistics of any type of jump with only 0.3 fatalities per 100,000 jumps over the past 10 years. You are more likely to be struck by lightning or win the lottery than to die on a tandem skydive, just to put that into perspective. The most dangerous part of skydiving is driving to the drop zone. The ratio of traffic related fatalities per 100,000 licensed drivers stood at 15.8 in 2019. Let's just put this into perspective. Vending machines kill 13 people a year by falling on top of them. And on top of that, about 450 people die annually by falling out of bed, usually from head or neck injuries, which is wild to think about. Once again, you're more likely to die in a car accident or driving to the DZ than you are actually jumping out of the plane doing a tandem skydive. And just in case you don't believe me, I'm going to leave all the links below to where I got these statistics from. A lot of them was from the USBA and then other websites like that. So if we're going over the emergency procedures and the equipment, we're going to go ahead and look at a rig displayed here. This is my beautiful rig. So first things first, we're going to have the emergency handles which are located here we have our right and our left and we also have our AAD system we have our RSL here which is right here connected to the three ring system which we're also gonna go over and then if you come around back here we have both the reserve here and then the main parachute here so first things first we're gonna go over the main so if we go ahead and look down here this is gonna be where our main parachute is located within our container system and just to kind of go over some stats I have here on my phone so according to the USPA which collects and publishes skydiving accident statistics about one in every 1,000 parachutes will experience a malfunction so significant that actually requires the use of a reserve parachute so with that being said from the main we will talk about the reserve Okay, so this is gonna be your reserve parachute here. It's gonna be located right underneath this top flap here and you can see it's sealed. This is gonna be in case of emergencies that you have a backup parachute. So once again, this is your main parachute down here located in the container and then right above it is typically gonna be your reserve parachute just in case of emergencies. So a quick thing when you're looking at your reserve, just to know your pin should be halfway seated, just like that through the closing loop. And if it doesn't have a seal on it, you definitely want to take it to a rigger and get it checked out because it should always have a seal when jumping your reserve. Okay, so a quick FYI, when you look at the reserve seal, obviously the seal comes from a rigger. You have to be a rigger in order to pack a reserve. Unlike the main, you do not need to be a rigger to pack the reserve. So if you look here, we have the STS, which is gonna be the rigger seal and signature. And then if you look at the card, which in my case is located here, you can tell when the last time the rigger packed it. And it should be packed every six months. So if you wanna go ahead and look at this card, I'm not gonna open it now, but you can look at this card, tell when the last time someone packed it was, and then that's basically them saying, hey, this is safe to jump, I packed it, I looked over it, I inspected it, it's good to go. So just a quick stat according to the USBA about reserves, in 2020, the USPA recorded 11 fatal skydiving accidents at a rate of 0.39 fatalities per 100,000 jumps. And that's once again, including off of the reserve parachute. So now that we've talked about both the main parachute and the reserve parachute, we're gonna actually talk about the emergency procedures or cutaway, the cutaway handles in order to get our reserve up and over our heads. This way we're safe. So let's say we have an emergency. We have these handles here. We have our right handle and we should have our left handle, but this is an example rig. It obviously doesn't have a reserve or a main inside of it, but for demonstration purposes, we will have our two handles, the one on the right, and then typically we'll have the one on the left. So what the one on the right does is cut away our main. And I'm sure you're curious of how that happens, so I'm gonna show you right now. So I have an emergency. I'm pulling my right handle, which is gonna go ahead and release my main parachute so I can get a reserve up and over my head. When I pull this right handle, 
I'm removing it and essentially releasing these cables. Now, these cables are gonna go up these metal housings to this cable right here. It's all the same cable, they're all connected. Now, when I remove this top cable here, it'll release the risers. They should be already released. The canopy's up and overhead. We're having a malfunction. While this comes out, it's gonna release the three ring system, essentially removing everything like that so that your main can disconnect. So I'm gonna show it again on this side. Once again, we're here. The risers are already gonna be up and over our head right now. If you can imagine the main is over our head. This is the main riser right here. We're having a problem with this. Uh, if you flip it to the back, once I remove this little yellow wire right here, once again, which is off the handle, just like that, it releases, it releases this closing loop. And then what that closing loop essentially does is release the three ring system where the small ring goes through the medium ring, the medium ring goes through the big ring, and then now your main parachute is disconnected from the container. So just to show how strong this three ring system is, you can go ahead and see that all I'm gonna do is hold this closing loop with two fingers. As somebody pulls on them, and you can see she's pulling pretty hard, but at the second I let go of the two fingers, it releases the three ring system. So the main thing that I wanted to explain with that three ring demonstration is it doesn't take a lot of tension. That little yellow cable is not under a lot of tension. Uh, the three ring system basically distributes the tension and the weight so that all you have to do is hold it with two fingers. As you can see, there wasn't a lot of tension there, but the second you release it, everything goes and your main is gone. Now that we understand the three ring system, what's connected on the left hand side and this rig, my rig is different on the right hand side, but on this rig, it's the left hand side. This little thing right here with the tab is going to be your RSL. For those of you who do not know, our RSL stands for reserve static line. So what that essentially means is when you cut away your main, which we'll do here, we'll go ahead and cut away. We release it. You see the RSL is still attached. What the RSL is gonna do is when it comes out and this is pulled away, essentially it's gonna pull your reserve for you and you don't have to go ahead and punch out on the other handle. It'll go ahead and pull your reserve for you. So now that we've gone over the main parachute, the reserve parachute, the cutaway handles, the three ring system and the RSL, the last thing that we need to go over, and I'm sure a lot of you guys will be happy about this, I finally got an AAD. So what AAD stands for is automatic activation device. So let's say I was on a skydive and I was unable to pull my parachute in free fall and I had passed out or for whatever reason, what this little robot does inside of my little backpack will go ahead and automatically deploy my reserve parachute just in case of an emergency. So it's like a safety, like super insurance just to make sure that all things go well. How to turn this on, because a lot of people are super confused about this. What you're gonna go ahead and do is press this button here. When you see something, you press it again. When you see something, you press it again. You let it calibrate and then it's ready to go now. Now it's ready to go we know it's on and we can enjoy our skydive. You definitely do not wanna do this in the plane. You wanna always do this before you get on your plane. So that's basically the overview of the rig and all the safety things you should know. If there's anything that I left out, please be sure to comment them because I'm sure I tried to go in depth as thoroughly as I could. But once again, we went over the main parachute. If you have an issue with the main, you go to your reserve. How do you go to your reserve? You go with your handles. These are your cutaway handles, which will release the three ring system. And then once again, we have our RSL and our AAD. This is the overview. Now to the practical ways that we can make skydiving more safe. So these are gonna be some of the practical ways that you can go ahead and make skydiving safer. The first one is gonna be do not track up jump run. And I have this beautiful map here to explain what I mean by that. So let's say in a hypothetical situation that let's say, let's just go against this one on the map. This is runway 30. We're gonna use this as jump run, meaning the plane is gonna drop off the skydivers up this same runway. With that being said, groups are gonna get out here, 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 all the way up here. So let's say you were tracking, so you wanna track perpendicular, which is not parallel to the runway, meaning you wanna get as far away from jump run as possible. Do not track up jump run. What that can do is cause problems. Let's say you get out here, you're tracking up jump run, other groups are gonna get out here, you can go ahead and collide and have a problem, serious problem with them. So do not track up jump run, that's what I'm trying to say. 
So with that being said, do not track on jump run. Also a nice segue into that is give proper spacing. So once again, we're using this as jump run. Let's say the first group gets out here. You're gonna wanna give a delay of probably like anywhere from five to eight seconds, just depending on how many groups there is in the plane so that the next group will get out here and then the next group will get out here and the next group will get out here. This way, all the groups are not on top of each other and we're not having simultaneous deployments where people can collide. That's the main thing we're trying to avoid. So once again, a practical way to go ahead and be safe while skydiving is to pull at an appropriate altitude. Decision altitude is at 2,500. So in my mind, and of course you wanna to talk to the other skydivers, see what they're pulling at, see what groups are going ahead of you. But on my mind, a reasonable altitude to go ahead and pull at is anywhere from 4,000 to 3,500. This way you have more than enough time to go ahead and deploy your main, see if there's any issues, and then have time to go ahead and deploy your reserve and fix anything if necessary. And I just wanna say this quickly and make it as clear as possible. Sacrifice Sacrificing time for emergency procedures for more free fall time is not worth it ever. Another important thing, of course, is to always make sure that you're on the same page with the other jumpers at what time breakoff is. A uh, typical breakoff for me is anywhere from around 5,000 to 5,500, which is 5,500 feet. You'll see everybody do a big wave off, and then you're going to want to do a 180 and track away from the group. This way, when everybody's opening, they're as far away from everybody as possible. Once again, avoiding canopy collisions. So another practical way that we can go ahead and make skydiving safe, and I'm gonna go ahead and read this off our phone, and just so I don't mess it up. And then once again, each drop zone that you go to is gonna have different regulations and rules. So make sure you abide by that specific drop zone's rules. But typically at Skydive Deland, this is how we do things. So first people out the plane, this is gonna be the separation order or the groups entering the plane or exiting the plane. First people out the plane is gonna be the tracking groups. Secondly, we're gonna have the free fly groups. Thirdly, we're gonna have the belly groups. We're gonna have after that the skydive training program students or the AFF students and then come tandem skydives and then after that we're gonna have the high pullers or the canopy relative work people and then last but not least we're gonna have the wingsuit people leaving last out of the plane so once again that's the exit order and make sure you understand your exit order while entering the plane and exiting the plane is super important. Okay so another practical way that we can go ahead and make sure that we are safe while skydiving is making sure that we know the landing pattern before we even get on the plane once again we need to discuss that with the other jumpers so everybody's on the same page. I'm gonna go ahead and point us to this map here. Uh, you can see there's a drawing here if you can look closely. This is gonna be our holding area as hypothetical example and then everybody's gonna go ahead and do a right hand turn to the landing area which is gonna be this little triangle here. Once again, every DZ has different rules and regulations. Once again, you should agree and understand what the landing pattern is before you get on the plane. So in this video, just to give an overview, we went over the statistics about how safe skydiving truly is. We went over knowing your gear and how to do your emergency procedures if necessary. And then we also went over the practical ways that we can make skydiving safe for moving forward as a group and the community. So as you guys can see, skydiving is extremely safe. The numbers do not lie. It is that people make it dangerous when you start going beyond your abilities and you start pushing the limits. That's when skydiving starts getting dangerous. So with that being said, numbers do not lie. Go out, make a skydive. It's safer than taking a drive in your car. Once again, go do it. I encourage everybody to at least make their first tandem or join the sport of skydiving. That's why we're here once again. So if you've enjoyed the video, once again, smash that like button. Um, on the last video we did, the naked skydiving video, we got well over 200 likes. So I guess we're doing a naked jump. So for that, if you don't want to miss it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel moving forward. Comment what you guys want to see if you have any questions moving forward. Or if there's a wild video you guys want to see, go ahead and comment that below. I love you guys. As always, blue skies and be safe. This video we will cover not only the practical ways that we can make skydiving safer we will go over the statistics okay